Christ, everybody. You are home. Can you greet the people around you? Nudge them if you can. Behind, beside you, in front of you. Say to that person, welcome home. Welcome home, everybody. Those who are watching online. I can't see the camera, but we're everywhere. <laughs> Welcome home there. Welcome home. Thank you for tuning in with us. And we do hope that one day you can join us live here in PICC. Everybody's having a great time so far. Make some noise. Today, we're going to be talking about blessing and curse. What do you choose? Really? It is always offered. Is there an option of a blessing and a curse? Today, as we come before the Lord and listen in further to God's word, I hope that you seek the blessing. I do hope that you really want that blessing. Now, even if it doesn't appear properly yet, even if it has bore fruit, but hilaw pa, not there yet, just seek that there is blessing out of it. And even in difficult situations, you see that there is blessing embedded within it. Sometimes purpose is wrapped in pain. So how many here are in difficulty and in pain? Magingay. Ah, good. So let's come before the Lord and let's pray all together as our feast family, our favorite prayer in the name of the Father and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Open up your hearts, your hands out wide. Pray this together as a family. Today, I receive all of God's love for me. Today, I open myself to the unbounded, limitless, and overflowing abundance of God's universe. Today, I open myself to God's blessings, healing, and miracles. Today, I open myself to God's word so I become more like Jesus every day. Proclaim it. Today, I proclaim that I, that I am God's servant, that I am God's powerful champion. And because I am blessed, I am blessing the world in Jesus' name. Amen. With reverence to the word, together we sing. Nasa tamang nota. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Pray this prayer with me. Dear Lord, I seek your blessing. Speak to me. Your son, your daughter is listening in. May I get to know you more. And I will be transformed by your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Give the Lord a big, big hand. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. To open up our series, our talk, let's give a big warm welcome, please, to our founder and friend, Brother Bo Sanchez. Welcome to our brand new series, Blessing and Curse, for the next nine weeks. How many? nine weeks we're going to dive into Genesis. That's what we're going to do and it's going to be powerful. You might be saying, Brother Bo, Genesis? Pwede bang mag New Testament na lang tayo? Gospels, letters of Saint Paul, direct to the point. All things work for good to those who love God and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yung mga simple. But Genesis, why? Ask me why. If you go to Jesus in the Gospels and the apostles or the Pharisees and the religious teachers, when they asked him hard questions, Jesus would go back to page one of the Bible. That's what he would do. Genesis was very important to Jesus. And that's why we need to dive and study about Genesis. Ito yung problema. For most of us, modern people, Every time you hear the word Genesis, 
we think about Genesis in a very different way. Minsan, Genesis for us would be controversial questions. Si Adam at si Eve, totoong tao ba sila? Individuals? Or they're symbolic? Tsaka yung Genesis, seven days God created the world. Seven literal days ba talaga? 24 hours times seven. And therefore, if you follow the chronology of Genesis, planet Earth would be 6,000 years old only. But science will tell you the universe is 13.7 billion with a B years old. So ano ba talaga? I have sad news for you. Ask me what? I will not address those questions. Ask me why? Because the author of Genesis wrote Genesis not as a science textbook. Genesis was written for a very different purpose. He was not thinking about scientific concepts. He was not thinking about the modern scientific categories that we think about right now. Some people look at Genesis and say, they're just ancient, irrelevant fairy tales. Adam and Eve having a conversation with a talking snake. Hello, Noah's Ark. Gano ba talaga, talaga kalaki yung Noah's Ark? Kasha, lahat ng hayop, pears. Is Noah's Ark made of wood? Paano yung termites? Ang daming mga tanong, ancient fairy tales. No relevance to our personal life. My dear friends, if that's what you think about Genesis, that is a huge mistake. We'll explain as the weeks go by. Is Genesis a bunch of moral stories? A lot of people think so. If you grew up in church, the characters, the personalities of the Bible, Abraham, Jacob, Isaac, these are holy men, holy people, models of virtue, and therefore, you imitate them. For example, Abraham. Abraham, 99 years old. Walang anak. And then God says, you will be the father of many nations. And Abraham trusted God. Ang ganda, no? Inspiring. But there is a problem. Ask me what again? Very selective reading of the life story of Abraham. You will, you will have to skip horrible parts of his life where he did horrible things. Abraham, at one time, to save his own skin, he lied through his teeth, put his wife in grave danger to commit and fall into adultery. He did that twice. Is Abraham good or bad? There are certain parts of the stories of these characters we do not want to talk about. But in this series, we have to talk about them. Why? Because maybe the writer of Genesis did not write the stories of these characters as moral stories so that we can imitate them and become good boys and good girls. Merong siyang ibang purpose. And that's what we will delve in today. My dear friends, Jesus read Genesis in a very special way. And that's how we need to read it too. Raise your hand if you want to follow Jesus. 
Are you sure? Then you must do one thing. Read the Bible the way Jesus read the Bible. That's what we need to do. Do I hear a loud amen? amen? And so what we're going to do in this next nine weeks will be very difficult. Very difficult. Because in reality, the Bible was not written to you. It was written for you. And that's a big difference. Can I give you a story? Walang sagot. One of the favorite things that I do is I like reading in coffee shops. That for me is a piece of heaven, a piece of paradise. So when I went to Seoul, Korea, there were many gorgeous coffee shops there. I would go from one to another just to read. Here was the problem. My wife loves K-drama. How many K-drama fans are here? You can relate. I would always hear her say, Saranghe. I do not know why, but I assumed that Saranghe means thank you. I really don't know why I thought that, but that's what I did. So in every coffee shop I went in Korea, every time I ordered food, I will say, Saranghe. Every time, every time, you know, the, the waiter would come and give me the coffee, I would look at him and say, Saranghe. By the fourth coffee shop, I kind of like sensed there was something off. Like they looked at me rather strangely. At the end of the day, my wife and I finally met, and in the hotel room I said, Sweetheart, what does Saranghe mean? Thank you, Diba. She had this look of horror in her face. Like she said, oh no, Bo, what have you done? Saranghe means I love you. I turned red as a tomato because on that day, I proposed my enduring love to two very pretty Korean cashiers and three male baristas. The reason why that happened was because I did not know Korean. And that's exactly the problem of the Bible. The Bible was not written to you, it was written for you. The Bible was not written in 21st century English. No, it wasn't. It was written thousands of years ago in Hebrew, in Greek, and in Aramaic. Now think about that. Written to a different audience, using a different language. So what do we need to do? We need to find out, go into that world, and you see, words have specific meanings. Sentences have specific meanings. Paragraphs have specific meanings. Stories, books have specific meanings. Hindi mo pwedeng sabihin, ito ang ibig sabihin para sa akin. You know, and, and, and you say, teka muna, teka muna. Before you do that, you want to know what did the original author mean when he wrote that story. Am I making sense to you? Kailangan malaman mo yun. What, you know, when the author was writing that story, what message was he trying to convey? Do you believe that this book was inspired by the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? If you believe that the Holy Spirit inspired that author to write that story, then we must listen to the author. 
What is, what's he trying to say? And that's why the Genesis story is going to be amazing. Because maybe for the first time, for many of us here in this room, your eyes will be open and the message of God will rock your world. That's my prayer. I really believe that. And I am praying that that will happen. The Genesis book is a long book and we're not going to be able to cover everything. I'm going to ask to give I'm going to ask you to have an assignment with me. I'll ask you to read the chapters 1 2 3 of Genesis so that you'll be ready, you will have a better understanding why we're talking about this and uh, it's not it cannot be a whole week long Bible study but to give you better reference read it for yourself Genesis 1 to 3 yes can I see an, can I hear an amen please I'd like to preach on the message God made you good parang hindi ka makapaniwala God made our world very good it was good God made us good why do we see the world not good why it's so messed up because we messed it up we made the wrong choices we made we chose to curse than to bless we chose the curse than the blessing we see each other as a curse rather than as a blessing if we understand Genesis we could understand the way Jesus understands Genesis the better it is for us to understand the rest of the Bible and that's why we're taking this one as brother Bo has said and let me go to the first sentence of the Bible it's very loaded the first te- sentence of the Bible in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth the earth was formless and empty and darkness covered the deep waters and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters this is good it is astonishing because for many people maybe some of you or maybe some of us I just got to learn this also very recently we thought uh, in the last few years we thought that you know before creation there was nothing there was zero nada but this is loaded it says there's something ancient people way way generations thousands of years before years before us they actually thought there is something and this is not just in Genesis not just in the Jewish culture but in the culture of that time Assyrians Babylonians Egyptians even in Mesopotamia they had different origin stories by one cultures but ibang stories and uh, there is always something before creation and I want to highlight the word formless and empty Genesis described these two as there is something further darkness covered the waters darkness covered the deep waters and know that these are two things number one is darkness number two is chaotic waters darkness and chaotic waters are obstacles to life but we see in the first light of the creation in Genesis God doesn't see it as an obstacle your darkness your chaos is not an obstacle to God's work God is greater than darkness and chaos how many here feels that their life is in darkness and their situation is chaotic give it to God let God take control God is in control God can bring life to you effortlessly as we're gonna go through the the creation story effortlessly Jesus God God declares God declares without any struggle creation so let's do this day one to six day one in set it God says let there be light and there was light that's how easy it was 
It is until now. He did this by separating light from darkness. And then in day two, God separates the waters above from the waters below. This sounds strange for us modern people. But focus on what the author of Genesis was trying to say. God did not get rid of darkness or the chaotic waters. Instead, He contains them. That's a big, big difference. He sets boundaries. He sets limits. He was able to set it apart. Are you still with me? In day three, here we go, God makes the dry land rise from the waters. He creates a refuge from the chaos. Your life, it's not going to be chaos forever. God can create God can recreate and give us refuge from chaos. And He gives us a bonus. As you'll see in the Bible verse flash, fruit trees were there, grow in the land. And you know what it represents? It represents that God wants us to be fruitful. So if it's not fruitful yet, if it's not abundant yet, God is not done with you yet. This is such a very comforting line. This is very loving of God. He created a beautiful place for us to enjoy His abundance. The fruitfulness in our lives where we can experience a lot of blessings. That's why we choose to stay with God. Because that's where the fruits are, the blessings are. To live a life with God. And let me say this further. Let me insert the message. Your life is without purpose is chaos. Get it from day one, day two, day three. There is a beginning purpose. And again, the bonus is there are fruit trees, fruitfulness, abundance. But putting it in real life perspective further, your life without purpose is chaos. I've met a lot of people, patients, families, losing their minds, losing their health, losing their lives. And they can point to many external factors. But you got to understand there's also something happening within. And, and I always find a deep, deep root of their sickness, of their, their, of their difficulty is because they cannot find purpose. They are not living purposeful lives. I've seen people who retire After retirement, that's when they get sick. That's when they die in the next few years. Sad to see because there wasn't any transition of a purpose. My mom, I saw that she is a doctor. She's able to transition from being a doctor. She is still a doctor at 72. She she transitioned to telemedicine. Mm -hmm. 72 can see people in telemedicine, was able to still live fruitful life. And now she has a lot of apos. That's why she is on an apostolic mission to take care of us. And, you know, it's, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It, and, and it's still part of God's plan for us. If you can relate to this, God is not done with you yet. Our origins tell us whatever seasons God supplies We live in a fruitful place if we are with God. The moment that we embrace purpose, the moment we embrace boundaries, you'll see, you'll see beautiful things come into your life. My prayer for all of us, may you find God's purpose. May you live God's purpose in your life. Amen. Amen. Remember, pre-creation, it was formless, and empty. And then that's the outline of the seven days of creation. So let me walk you through what it means. From day one to three, God dealt with the formlessness. He sets boundaries. He puts order in the midst of chaos. In day four to six, God deals with emptiness. He fills the earth with His blessings. He puts us, sets us up for abundance with His goodness. So before we discuss day four, five, and six, 
you got to understand that biblical authors love these patterns everywhere in the Bible. And the Genesis authors, they're the same. They're no different. There is a pattern for this. And if you observe carefully, that's when you look at the slide now. From day one, it connects with day four. There was no light. Let there be light. There, day four, there was light separating day and night. Beautiful. That's a pattern, yes? Uh, day two connects with day five. Day three connects with day six. I love it. Day three, God declared the seed emerges from the ground. And then, there you go. Provided trees and plants with so many bonuses. Such a complicated book. But it's so good to understand. Again, if we understand Genesis the way Jesus understands it, we will be so much better in following Him so we could get this context. Everybody say context. So day four to six, let's do this together. In day four, God fills the sky with the stars, the sun, and the moon. But the author, actually, in the Bible, calls them not sun and moon. In Hebrew, it's called little lamp and big lamp. Sources of light. Big lamp and little light. It wasn't called for anything. And day four again connects with day one. Because in day one, it is God who gives light. And in day four, God assigns the sun and the moon, the big lamp and the small lamp, to give that role. What are we trying to say here? Early on, God is sharing roles. God is sharing His rule with His creatures. God is a sharing God. On day five, God fills the waters below the fish, below with fish and birds to fly near the water above. The very waters is separated in day two. And here again, God is passing His role by blessing His creatures that He created with the ability to multiply and to create new life. Look at the person beside you again to put it in a practical perspective. The person beside you is created by God and that person is blessed by God, anointed by God to live a fruitful life. You can multiply. You have that role. God shares with you that role. And in day six, in the last day of creation, God creates all the land animals, the crawling creatures and the wild animals to fill the dry land. And at that very end, He created humans. He created mankind. And when He does, God doesn't just bless the humans like the fish in the sea, in the water, birds in the air, and the animals that walk the earth. He, we are different from... from he, he doesn't just give a special role like the big lamp and the small lamp, sun and moon. God calls us, mankind, differently. Something special. He called us to be like Him. Images of God. God calls humans images of Him. Humans are pictures of what God is like to the rest of the world. That's why we always say we are God carriers. We are image bearers. Look at, again, the people around you. Image of God. Yes. And it is equal for all. Genesis story, especially as we're understanding this in the next few weeks, at least as we're discussing the chapter one, and as you said, and we align together, you'll read chapter one, two, and three, so that you will understand the context further. We'll answer three questions, okay? Number one, who is this God? Who is this God? As you may have been seeing it, we have an amazing God. We have an amazing God. You know why? Ask me why. The evidence is very clear. You look at the birds. You look at the fish. You look at the animals. Look at nature. And especially look at the person beside you. It's amazing. <laughs> you got to see that God has an incredible...
incredible creative power from something dark, hostile, formless, empty. He turns it into something where life can flourish, where abundance is there, and he can turn something really bad into something really good. Maybe you've come here asking God, Lord, why? Why is this happening? Why is, so, why is life so bad? Oh, I've asked that to the Lord. I kid you not. But I'm preaching to myself, and when I'm reading it, and I'm studying it, God is reminding me, don't think it's bad. I will turn it into really, really good. Go home today knowing that God can turn your really, really bad situation into something really, 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 really good. Amen? Amen. God is also a sharer. He's very generous. He fills the earth. He fills our lives. He fills the world with fruit trees where there is fruit enough for everybody. We have everything that we need. And not only that, He shares His power to us to rule His land, His creatures, like the lamps in the sky, with us. We are in charge of it. And thirdly, really, God really loves humans. Genesis is so human-centric, and it's so good to study it and understand it. Humans are not accidents. We did not just appear by any chance. We are designed, planned, crafted, wonderfully made by the Lord. And in fact, God creates us to be His partners in His creation. So that's who our God is. Question number two, who are these humans? We are the kings and queens on earth. And this was not just for a certain kind of human. In other Genesis stories, in other creation stories of other cultures, there's a specific person, there's a specific dynamic itchura dating position. But our belief tells us in our own Genesis story, this is not just for any certain kind of human. This is not just only for men or women or for the rich or for the powerful. Being His representative is offered for all humanity. Men and women, male and female, rich and poor. It is all for us. This was so radical. It is radical especially in the ancient world. And even up to this day, this is revolutionary. When we see a lot of inequality, when we, when we see the world is so messed up, this truth disturbs us. This truth disrupts our social structures. Because according to Genesis, all humans deserve to be treated equally. We are all the same. We're all kings and queens. And last third question, what happened with all that goodness? This is crucial. Listen to me. God made the world good. God created humans good. God created our lives to be very good. God created people to be good. But in fact, Genesis 1 ends with God living with His creation. If you read it, you will understand it. That's the meaning of the seventh day. God is resting with His creation. God did not work on the seventh day. God was with who and with what He created on the seventh day. In short, He lived with us. He enjoyed His goodness with us. Beautiful. In Genesis 2, God is still living in the you, with the humans in the garden, with the animals living in harmony. And then open in chapter 3, bam! <laughs> That's where the fall comes in. But actually, actually, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. That's why I ask you to read it up to Genesis 3. Up to, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is a profound reflection of what the world would look like 
if humans truly represented God, if we humans truly represented the image of God, and if it stops there, it would have been so beautiful. But as you can see, we've failed. We've messed up. We don't live in harmony with God, in harmony with one another. People are living fruitless, restless lives. Not with one another, not even with animals. Instead, we wage war. War with each other, nations, families, even churches, church groups, even within families. Human dignity is broken, ignored. Di mo na talaga maintindihan. While people are accumulating riches, they're doing so well. And on the other side, people are dying of hunger. It's crazy, right? How many here feels that sometimes the world is turning out to be crazy? Remember that this is also the broken world that Jesus walked in and lived in. And that's very comforting. There was disobedience of the plan for us to be the image of God, for us to be the bearers. And, you know, we take care of God's creation. Instead of being images of God, we wanted to be God. Instead of ruling with God, we wanted to rule without God. We didn't want to be just God's kings and queens. We wanted to rule on our own selves, in our own empires. That's why it has become a broken world. And when you go to chapter 3, you'll see that this is what it looks like. The chapter 3 it looks like that's the world today, broken, out of paradise. But you know what? Some people think that Jesus came to rescue the righteous from this bad world by putting them, you know. We have this concept that it's supposed, we were supposed to be perfect. It was a perfect setup. But if you read Genesis, there was a lot of good, but there was no mention of perfect. Do you get that? We see a lot of people think it has to be perfect. We, we see that why we're suffering now because we got out of that perfect world. That's why there are organizations, cultures, religious that say, you know, just go into our spaceship and we will go back to heaven. No, that's not our Christianity isn't about securing, securing just our own salvation. It's about working again with Jesus who is building his kingdom in this broken world here and now. The problem is the fractured images called humans. It's us. So the challenge is with us also. So what Jesus does, he runs after us. He lives with us, sends his spirit to empower us. He heals us. He gives us second, third, fourth chances. And on the cross, Jesus absorbs our collective sins and mess in this world. And in his broken body, Jesus collects the brokenness that we have unleashed in this world. Jesus bore it for us. Even our stupid choices that we have made and still our making. Jesus overcomes our sins with his love. And that is the beautiful message of today. His love is transforming us again, redeeming us back to the full image of God that we are called to be. He is calling each of us you, 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 and you to again represent His goodness in this world even if it's broken. How? We serve. We love. We continue to work in integrity just like how, did it, how Jesus did it. You want to follow Christ, wash other people's feet. 
you become the last. Let them be the first. Trust in God's wisdom. Again, serve the last place. Trust in God's wisdom. That is our calling for today. When you look at yourself again, remember that you are an image of God. And when you look at the world again, you know it is good. There is, there is so much potential. And that's why it's not good because we wasted that potential of being good. It's, and it's not yet too late. Look at the person beside you and say, it's not yet too late. God is going to make this place good again. God is going to make your life good again. God is going to make you look at yourself good again. That's what you take home today. He's setting boundaries. He's setting limits. He's giving us purpose again. He's filling us up with His goodness. Hey, our lives are still set up for abundance and fruitfulness, not emptiness, not chaos. God made you good. So be good. Easy to say, hard to do. And that is the challenge. And it's so comforting that it's not just me. It's not just Brother Bo. It's not just Brother Audie. Not just Father Albert. It is all of us called Christians, Christ followers, God followers, to continue to remain good, to do good, and be good. God made you good, and He is not giving up on you. Amen. How many are blessed today? Make some noise to the Lord.